So let me just say we've been uh, we've been talking to Chris Galanos. We've been talking about uh, how he God led him to start a church in uh, in Lubbock, Texas, that went from basically zero to ten thousand in ten years. But this is a great place to make a shift. I want to spend the rest of our time together uh, talking about uh, disciple making movements. So you you've gotten on to, to the disciple making movement. You realize God's got a vision for you that you can't reach using an attractional model that you've been using as as, a, as successful as it was. It's not going to do it. So you you and your staff and your team lead the church, and and your God's leading you through this process. Talk a little bit about, for somebody who has no idea about disciple-making movements, can you just introduce that concept? How would, or let me put it this way, how would you introduce the concept of what a disciple-making movement is? I think, Kevin, the easiest way to think about a disciple-making movement is to think about a literal reading of the Great Commission. Hmm. So what we've got are disciples that are being told to make more disciples. We've got this idea of multiplication in all the nations. The Greek is pantata ethne. It means like all, but um, everything in it as well. So it's disciple all nations, but disciple all in a nation. It has that sense as well. So we, we kind of skip past that sometimes. And then we're baptizing people. So we're leading lost people to Jesus. So movements, Kevin, tend to be focused on loss, bringing new people into the kingdom. It's like the Great Commission sending us out to do, to reach lost people, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then a big... Um, a big movements element is the next part. Jesus said, teach them to obey. In our context, the Western context is often we're teaching people to learn, teaching people to know. You move on, Kevin. You, you, you're you going to do a new sermon next week, than a different one than you did this week, not because anybody's done it, but because you did it last week. <laughs> like we, we, we already know it, so we move on. We don't move on, Kevin, when we obey. In our context, we move on when we know. But Jesus said, teach them, these new disciples, to obey or observe all the commands that I've given you. So in movements, again, we're making disciples that multiply. That's the first part. Among lost people, we're baptizing them in all nations, in fully in within a nation. We're teaching them to obey then all Jesus has commanded. And he promises us, and he had to bring Kevin, I think, promise them after giving them the 200 million vision, he had to <laughs> promise them he'd be with them or else they'd have no confidence they could accomplish it. Exactly. So he gives us this big vision, tells us what to do and says, hey, don't worry. Don't let, it, don't let the size of the vision freak you out. I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. So it's the idea, Kevin, in movements of multiplying disciples. And these disciples are lost people that are coming to faith in Christ. So it's focused on the lost and it's teaching them to obey. So often a, a definition we give in the training, Kevin, is obedience-based discipleship that sees disciples reproducing disciples, leaders reproducing leaders, churches reproducing churches, and movements reproducing movements. Key elements are multiplication, and we're teaching people to obey as a sign of spiritual growth, not just know as a sign of spiritual growth. Boy, that's um, okay. So I need three hours to unpack everything that Chris just said. <laughs> um, but Chris, I'm so I'm going to, you know, I'm in Maryland, you're in Texas, and uh, and we live in the same country, but those are two different worlds apart. Yeah. Uh, let me just push on, on this a little bit, because um, the first thing I want to push on is in our culture today in the West, in, in, our, in, our, in America, it is not politically correct to talk about lost people. Mm -hmm. Even church people. I, I, I mean, I'm going to say this. I think that a lot of church people do not have a heart to reach the lost people. I mean, Jesus was very clear. Wouldn't you leave the 99 and go after the one lost sheep? I, I know what it's like to be. I'm a prodigal, so I know what it's like to feel lost. Uh, and I know what it's like to, to feel found. But there is almost a, an inculturation that's happened over the years in, the, in our culture to, to be against this idea of seeing people as lost. That's their religion or, you know, maybe they have their own faith or whatever. Would you just, I mean, I'm just asking you to be blunt uh, yeah. on that, 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 you know, how do we get the church? Because you're not going to want to do a movement if you don't have a passion to see lost people. Because you just said movements happen with lost people. Talk about that to, to uh, our audience. Yeah, Kevin, I think the way um, you discern, uh, you know, what to do in a situation like you described is you have to ask yourself the question, what is my authority? If culture or politics or being politically correct is your authority, then you can only talk about things in a certain way. If God's word is your authority, and Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which is lost, yeah. 
and he sent out the disciples to do the same thing, then it doesn't matter what culture saying. <laughs> it doesn't matter what government's saying. It doesn't matter what anybody's saying. The question is, Kevin, what's your authority? And if your authority is God's word and you're standing on God's word, then you're going to acknowledge there are lost people out there that don't know Christ that are going to die and go to hell unless they hear the gospel, they repent of their sin, and they put their faith in Christ. So even if that's not popular, Kevin, that really doesn't matter. <laughs> the question is, how do you determine what you believe? And if you determine what you believe based on what society says is fair or what some, uh, you know, um, celebrity thinks is, is neat or, you know, how we've evolved as a people, if that's your authority, man, then your beliefs are going to be changing all the time. <laughs> but yeah. if your authority is God's word, then you know that there are certain things that are just true. And that is that there are people in need of Jesus. And Kevin, it gets worse than that. It's not just some lost people that haven't responded to the gospel. There's lost people in the world that have never heard the gospel. Right. And Jesus said the reason for that is that the workers are few. So that's even on Christians. The, re the reason there are still unreached people groups in the world where people haven't even heard the gospel is because there haven't been enough Christian workers to go and tell them. So Kevin, I would just respond to that by saying, I'm not really concerned when it comes to what I believe, what society is saying or what culture is saying. My authority for my life and a Christian's authority is God's word. We believe his word and stand on his word regardless of what others are saying. So there's a little illustration of what I meant about Chris unbelievably gentle, but unbelievably clear and firm. I love that about you. I really do. I really do uh, love that about you, Chris. Thank you for that. So, I mean, one of the things that maybe we need to do as, as, as Christians is start with, God, give me a heart for the lost. I, I maybe, you know, maybe I'm not agonizing over the fact that there are people that don't have the, the hope that we have because of Christ. And, and if you're, if you're saying, if you're sitting and going, my Bible study doesn't really talk about lost people. We don't pray for lost people. My church doesn't, um, and I'm not. Then maybe it's just God, give me your heart. If you know, because how can I ever be obedient to you if I don't have your heart for what you called us to do? Um, Chris, let me ask you another question about that. I I would say, and, and again, this is this is not uh, this is more anecdotal, but. The majority of folks that I've asked over the years, and I've been asking these questions for a long time, I had the privilege of being discipled uh, by a, a wonderful mentor in my life. Um, but most people that I ask in the church, have you ever been discipled? They'd say, no, mm -hmm. I've, I've never been discipled. If you ask them, have you ever discipled anyone? They would say, no. Have you ever spoken to anyone uh, about the Lord? Have you had spiritual conversations? So the answer to all of those questions for, for in the circles that I've traveled in are almost always no. In fact, some of them would say, well, that's what the pastors are there for. That's what the missionaries are there for. But the whole point of disciple making movements is to unleash everyday disciples into their everyday life, life that they're already living so that they can be used of God. Would you say a few things about that? Was that happening in, in Experience Life Church before were these people coming to faith and then they were going out and discipling people or was it not happening? They were just bringing them to church in a more attractional model. Yeah. So I would say, um, I would say the latter for sure. And I, and, and I wouldn't blame that on the sheep. I just, the lack of intentionality on our part, probably to make disciples that multiply because what seemed effective to people in our church was just to bring their friends to church yes. and we could preach to them, you know, that kind of thing. But I would say, Kevin, this again goes back to, um, you know, what you were saying earlier about uh, having a heart for the lost. Let me tell you what will give you a heart for the lost. And let me tell you what will convince you that it's not just your pastor's job to go and make disciples. It's called God's word. Mm. One of the problems we have in our churches today, Kevin, is the people of God don't read the word of God. Amen. If you read the word of God, it'll set you on fire and you'll go, that mission is not just for Pastor Kevin. That mission is for me. Right. Jesus had a heart for lost people. Jesus, would you? So in addition to praying, God, give me a heart for lost people. Kevin, you wouldn't even have to, we won't even, as pastors, have to prompt them to pray that. If they're reading their, the scriptures, they're going to be, by a Holy Spirit, as he speaks to them through the scriptures, led to pray that. God, what does Jesus mean here? What does the Great Commission mean for me? I'm seeing this in Acts. I'm not seeing this in our church. Lord, would you do it in our church and would you use me? I see John and Peter in Acts 4. It says they were unschooled, ordinary men. That's like me. Somebody yeah. reading the Bible might think that's like me. And, but they had been with Jesus and they had boldness and they said, basically, I'm not going to stop speaking about what I've seen and heard. And they go back to a prayer meeting. They start praying. The place shakes. They're all given boldness. They go out doing miracles and preaching God's word of boldness. And Kevin, they're just ordinary people. <laughs> so, so I think part of the problem, Kevin, is people in our churches, they don't even know that story. Yeah. 
And it's not because always you haven't told them or I haven't told them, but even if we've told them, you're not going to remember unless you're regularly reading God's word. So Kevin, we would always encourage people, especially in this new season, to do at least you know a year through the Bible plan each year as a family or with your spouse or something, Kevin, because we've got to know God's word and God's word is what will set us on fire, help us get the heart of God for lost people, for his mission and for multiplying disciples. But Kevin, how are we going to get it if we don't spend time in God's word? Boy, that is so, Chris, thank you. And let me just say this, as I've understood, as, I, as I've learned from you and, uh, and studied this, the, one, of the, one of the DNA pieces of, of a disciple-making movement is discovering God's word for yourself. And now you want to talk about something that goes against the grain of pastors. Uh, we've been trained, we've been called by God to be teachers and preachers. And, and um I was sharing some DMM principles with a pastor recently, and I could just see him in his face. He's like, mm, mm, you know, um, but w- what we've done without realizing it, and, and it's really almost a, a Roman Catholic model, even though most Protestants would say we wouldn't believe that, is that you've got to come to me and I'll help you understand the word. Yes. We are not training our people to discover the truth of God's word by reading it themselves. Could you say a word or two about that? And that's the great reformation, Kevin. I mean, that's what Luther and these guys fought for so that everybody could have a Bible in a language they could understand. Kevin, why? So that just believers could read it or just pastors? No, Luther wanted everybody reading it. And so everybody reading it for themselves because then they would see that some of the things they were being taught was not true. So Kevin, if we're just relying on teachers, then how do we know if what they're telling us is true? And then the teacher, Kevin, becomes our authority, but God's word should be our authority. And we're supposed to be like the Bereans that we're checking to see if what Paul was saying was even true. Exactly. So Kevin, I think, um, I, I think, and one, one misconception I think with DMM is that it, um, you know, it de-emphasizes the role of a teacher or preacher. And I actually don't think it does. I just think it uses it in different ways. So for example, um, one of the most important, uh, you know, things for people to do is unbelievers or even new believers is to begin to see God's word as an authority. And sometimes, Kevin, if we emphasize teaching too much or people hold it in the wrong um, perspective, then they're not like the Bereans. And all they know about God's word, like the, like in a Catholic context, would come from the teacher, not from the word of God. So, And then the second thing I'd say about teaching, too, is, Kevin, when we think about teaching, we think that there's one way to teach, namely lecture. That's not the only way to teach. And most studies show it's not the most effective way to teach. There's a number of ways to teach people to do things. You can teach through small group discussion. You can teach through practical application. You can teach through, you know, just Kevin, there's different things. And it, there's a, I've seen a pyramid before and it talks about all the ways to teach. If, if, if teaching Kevin is to cause people to learn something, if that's kind of the definition of, of teaching, then this pyramid talks about all the different ways people can learn things. And it talks about how effective they are and what the retention rate is for each of them. Kevin, this chart shows that lecture is the worst way to teach yeah, yeah. <laughs> if the goal is for them to learn and retain. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? And yeah. one of the best ways, Kevin, to teach is um, taking a concept and letting a small group discuss it. And then what makes it even better is if that small group tries to um, obey it. And then one step better is if they try to immediately teach somebody else, it helps with retention. So Kevin, I think kind of the misnomer of teaching is guy on a stage preaching for 30 minutes. Right. That's kind of an underdeveloped, in my opinion, view of teaching. You yeah. can teach in a number of different ways. And Kevin, I would say, I tell people all the time, we had five services at Experience Life, two on Saturday night, three on Sunday morning. And so they ask sometimes, do you miss that? You're not getting to teach as much, it doesn't seem like. I tell them, I'm teaching more than I've ever taught in my life. It just doesn't look like, Kevin, how we picture teaching, which is yeah. guy or gal on a stage on Sunday morning, 30 minutes, bam, bam, bam. Kevin, I think that's, again, a little bit of an underdeveloped uh, view of teaching. That's so good. Oh, man, Chris, that's really good. All right, so so let me uh, ask you this question, because one of the things that I, I think that folks have, because we've been, let me set the stage for this question, because we've been in kind of an information discipleship mode in the, in the church in the West, we think that, you know, people go to Bible studies week after week after week. They're not necessarily obeying anything. There's no accountability for obedience, but hey, I, I, I know enough now, or, or I mean, or I'm getting some information here. Now, what I've noticed is in those people, those folks, if you say, hey, are you going out and doing anything about, you know, reaching the lost? Well, I don't know enough yet. So we get in a loop where I, 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 all I keep doing is absorbing information, but I never seem to have enough for me to get over my fears and to go and begin to practice it. 
And, and in my limited experience, Christians can be some of the most resistant people yeah. who are already in the church to an obedience-based discipleship because all they've known is an information-based discipleship pattern. But how does spiritual growth work? Because we think of spiritual growth as, oh, I've been under this great teacher. You know, I listened to his sermons or her sermons or whatever. I've been in the Bible study with such and such. He's such a good teacher. Um, I've read the, his commentaries. How does spiritual growth, how, let me, let me ask this in two ways. How did Jesus deepen his disciples? And is that similar to how we do, you would say disciple making movements deepen their disciples as well? Absolutely. Obviously with Jesus, he was inviting his disciples not to just learn from him, but to follow him and to do what he was doing. I use James 1 a lot, Kevin, to talk about this. You know, he talks about, don't just listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, do what it says. Or we sometimes say, don't be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. But I like how it says, if you're just a hearer of the word, he says, and so deceive yourself. Yeah, Kevin, I interpret that as, if I'm a hearer of the word, I deceive myself into thinking I'm accomplishing something. <laughs> I'm growing spiritually. I'm, you know, but James is saying you actually deceive yourself if you're a hearer only. And we see this all the time in Matthew 7 when Jesus is talking about building your house on so the, house, the kind of the foundation of your life on solid foundation or sand. He says it's not just people that listen to me that, um, you know, and, and, that, you know, build their house on a solid foundation. He said it's people that listen and obey or listen and uh, apply, you know, what I'm saying. Paul talks about in even Philippians 4, um, you know, to follow my to follow my example, you know, put into practice the, the things that I'm saying. So, Kevin, again, what's going to reform this paradigm that, that maybe we've wrongly held for so long. It's the word of God. Rereading the word of God, Kevin, helps you to go, okay, Matthew 7, Philippians 4, James 1, Jesus's pattern. This is obedience-based. This was focused on not just knowing things, which he accused the Pharisees of doing. You know, we can be so Pharisaical, Kevin, if we focus mainly on knowledge, but this is about hearing and obeying. Not to merit righteousness before God, Kevin. This We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. His righteousness imputed to us. We stand before God on his righteousness, not ours alone. But once we've been saved and justified by faith in Christ, then we are to follow Christ. You know, and he talks about that, you know, whoever, you know, uh, whoever loves me will obey what I command. I mean, we see this as, as a pattern throughout the New Testament. So Kevin, I think the shift in the mindset of a believer will happen again if we read the word. But since we don't read the word, Kevin, why would we ever challenge what we've, you know, grown up with? We would just assume that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, I, I years ago, I started uh, trying to help our church and, and some of the leaders. I, I said that, you know, Jesus's model that I saw was in the scripture was he would say, come and see. In, in other words, come and see me, meet me, come and be with me. And then he right away sent them out to go and do it, it, he, I mean, it's amazing how quickly he sent the disciples out to do. They didn't even know who he was, really. And he's <laughs> sending them out. So it's like, come and come and meet with me. Go and do what you see me doing and you will learn and grow. The mm -hmm. church has turned that into something different. The church is, is working on a process of of come and see the church, yeah. not Jesus necessarily, but come and see the church. No, you know, kind of sit here and, and learn kind of uh, uh, instead of the go and do it's it's no and, and, you know, kind of just know and grow. But we never get to the no to the go and do. And, right. and you never will, because there's always something else that we feel like we need to right. know if you want to know it perfectly. So disciple making and disciple uh, making movements really does shift that back to a Jesus model of come and see Jesus in his word, meet him by reading his word. And then begin to immediately put into practice what he's saying to you in his word through the Holy Spirit, and you will deepen. But it's such a radically sh a radical shift from what most church people think that it's 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 hindering in some respects. I think uh, church leaders and and others in the church from embracing this. Are you finding that as well? Yeah. And Kevin, one thing that made me think of too a mantra that some of our Indian brothers and sisters in Christ have taught us is one thing they teach in their movement is no one thing, do one thing. Yeah. You don't need to know the second thing until you've done the first thing. Kevin, that's like revolutionary. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, <laughs> their, their opinion is, what's the point, Kevin, of learning something else if you haven't done what you already know? That's so If the goal is to follow Jesus and to be a doer of the word. So Kevin, I'll always remember that. They came here and we had some of our Indian friends come and share at our church. And they just said, remember this, no one thing, do one thing. 
know one thing, do one thing. You don't need to know the second thing till you've done the first thing. It just reminded us, Kevin, like you're saying, that this journey of following Jesus is not just about sitting there and listening all the time, but it's about getting up and following him, right. getting up and doing what he did, saying what he said, being sent out like he was sent out to heal the sick and proclaim that the kingdom of heaven is near. So, Kevin, again, the warped view we may have would only come from the fact that we, I read, I was reading it this morning in uh, the Gospel of Mark, he talks about how you can nullify the word of God while you uphold your tradition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kevin, how many things do we do that, you know, maybe inadvertently we're nullifying God's word because we've just always done it that way. Right. <laughs> you know, that's just in the American church. Why are you trying to change it, Kevin? Why yeah. are you trying to change it to obedience based? It's always been knowledge based. Just <laughs> leave it alone. Well, the reason we would want to make a change is because we don't see that in God's word. Right. We don't want to nullify, Kevin, God's word in order to uphold our traditions. And Kevin, I've done that. Yeah. I don't know if I, that I meant to, but I know that there have been times where God's words explicitly said this, but we kept doing it this way just because it's tradition. It's what we've always done. Jesus said we can nullify his word by our traditions. Kevin, we need to examine all of our traditions and make sure that Jesus is not saying to us any of those are nullifying his word. You know, there's something, Chris, that, that idea of the no, no one thing, do one thing. That, that's, that's kind of taking one step at a time, whereas for whatever reason, well, I would say this, we want to see the whole staircase before we take the one step. And <laughs> I think that has to do with our desire to stay in control. Mm -hmm. And discipleship is allowing Jesus to be in control. It's saying to Jesus, I'll follow you. Right. That's what he said to the fishermen. That's what he said to all of those. Hey, if you want to follow me, and discipleship is disruptive. I, I've noticed that we will give the church an hour, hour and a half maybe for information. But to be told in that hour, hour and a half, something that we now have to do, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, I got, I'm busy. I don't, have, I don't have time for the obedience piece. I was just looking for some information. So if, if we're not going to ever be able to be disciples if we're not willing to let God disrupt our lives. I love it, Kevin. And I even have a friend that says this too. He says he's been using the word discipleship less often and disciple making more often because it's more action oriented. That's discipleship good. can almost feel like learning stuff. Yeah. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been in discipleship. Oh, okay. So you've gone through some Bible studies. Whereas disciple making, Kevin, that kind of kind of makes you think, oh, now you're doing now you're doing something. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> you know? I really like that. So all right, Chris, uh, we're going to run out of time here, but here's, I want to ask this because you're a gifted coach and, and you, you, I know when you took us through the, the uh, DMM training, one of the, the elements in that is to, is to have ongoing coaching. Could you just say a little bit about that? Because it's in, in our Western culture, we think of coaching in a, in a way that isn't necessarily what DMM and, and the disciple making movement strategy is what is the what is the need for an ongoing coach what does an ongoing coach do and and what how do you see coaching in disciple making movement so it's kind of like jesus's role with his disciples when the disciples would come back from going somewhere you had somebody that knew maybe a little bit more than you or had experienced a little bit more than you that you could ask questions to so the idea of ongoing coaching kind of in the in dmm is there are people out there kevin that have seen what we want to see and so they've run into some of the challenges that we're running into. So we can move further faster if we learn from how they dealt with their challenges, if we learn from how they, you know, the different experiences that they had. So the idea of coaching is just having friends that are a few steps ahead of you that can kind of guide you on the journey, just so that, Kevin, you can get to where you're going more quickly by not having to make all the same mistakes somebody, somebody else has yeah. made. So just like the disciples could come back and ask Jesus questions, or what do you think about this? Or we went and, you know, the, uh, you know, this happened, you know, what should we do here? That's how, that's kind of our relationship with Stan. We've, he kind of got us started. We were on this journey, but we can call and say, hey, in India, have they run into this? Oh yeah, this is what they did. Oh, that helps us. You know, that helps us in our context because this principle, maybe not the exact practice or context is transferable, but the principle is transferable and that could really help us. So Kevin, it's more just about having somebody a few steps ahead that can share how they dealt with challenges and some of their experiences with you to help you get um, to the place that they have already gotten that you aspire to get to as well. That's uh, so awesome. All right, Chris, I'm going to give you uh, a few minutes. We, I cannot thank you enough. What, what would you want to say? I didn't, maybe I missed a question that you're like, man, I really wish he would have asked this. Or the one thing I want everybody who right now is even thinking about disciple making movements to know um, what is it? The, the, the floor is yours. 
So the fir first two elements that you guys would learn if you went through a DMM training with Kevin or myself or somebody else are, are these, and these are really important, Kevin, as you know. First, we've got to focus on God's word again. What is God's, or do you, you know, I would ask your listeners, are they, are y'all reading God's word? Do you know God's word? Or could you possibly be nullifying God's word, holding up traditions that you don't even know you're nullifying because you don't even know his word? I mean, yeah. are you focused on his word? And when we say focus on God's word, Kevin, we mean not just reading it, but reading it, obeying it, and sharing it with others, a regular pattern of doing that. So I would say we've kind of come back to this authority question over and over again. God's word is our authority. We are doing, uh, we want to do what God tells us to do, and we find out what God tells us to do in his word and as he leads us by his Holy Spirit. So that's number one. And number two is multiply extraordinary prayer. Kevin, like I said before, kind of what I always leave pastors with is go back to Revelation 2 and 3. Mm. Go back to Revelation 2 and 3 and just have ears. Make sure, and some of you may already, but make sure you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to your church. And make sure, Kevin, you're willing, I would say to people listening, that they're willing to hear it even if it's scary. Yeah. They're willing to hear it, even if what the Spirit's going to tell them is going to require faith. Because here's what I found, Kevin. If we pray and we say, Lord, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Usually what he tells us is going to require some faith. The journey of following Jesus is a journey of faith. Mm -hmm. If he tells you to do something that you think is scary because it's going to require faith, that's a good thing. Yeah. He's <laughs> inviting you to walk by faith. Don't you want to walk by faith? And yet, Kevin, so often as pastors, we can try to do, we do everything in our power to not have to walk by faith. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. We want to know how it's going to be and how it's going to work and how, you know, we don't want to have to like trust in God, you know, right. and take risks. And uh, I heard somebody say once, uh, the way you spell faith is R-I-S-K. You know, mm -hmm. you're willing to, you're willing to take a risk. You're willing to hear Jesus and know, man, this could cost me something, but Jesus is worth it. He's the greatest treasure. I'm going to go for it. So Kevin, I would just tell folks, make sure you know God's word. You're reading it and you're obeying it and sharing it. And number two, drop to your knees, get your elders together, leaders in your church. If you're a lay person, get groups of people in the church together to pray and fast and say, Lord, what do you want us to do? And then be willing, Kevin, all of us should be willing to do whatever he says, regardless of what it costs us. Yeah. Hey, Chris, uh, I'm just so, I, I, in fact, I'll see Chris later on today for uh, my ongoing coaching. And uh, Chris, can I, can I ask you this? If, if I want to just recommend, I've read Chris's book um, from Mega Church to Multiplication, uh, you can get that book, get it, read it. If they wanted to know more about uh, what's going on right now with you, would that be go to eLife? Uh, is that eLife.com? Yeah, so they, they could go to experiencelifenow.com and click on the blog. Okay. It's our wig take, we call it wig take DMM blog. And that kind of keeps you updated on the journey. And, uh, and you can always, of course, contact uh, us here. I will, and if you want, if, if I can help get you connected with Chris, I'll do that. Thank you so much, Chris, for what you've done in my life. I can tell you this, I am, I am praying more personally. Mm. Our church is praying more consistently and for longer periods of time since I went and did the training with Chris, I have become convinced I was, oh my gosh, I talked about praying, I didn't pray. And uh, the reality is God is changing my life and our ministry here as we have now begun to uh, multiply prayer throughout who, all of who we are. Uh, and I can't thank you enough for all that. I can't thank you enough for all you're doing in, in my life as well. So Chris, thanks for joining us here and uh, God bless you. I'll see you later. Thanks, Kevin. It's an honor. Oh bless man, bless you. Thank you.